If it's Tuesday, after being selected and sworn in, two jurors are dismissed from serving on Trump's criminal hush money trial over anonymity and credibility concerns. As the former president attacks prospective witnesses and jurors, and prosecutors accuse him of violating his gag order at least seven times in three days. Plus, the Kennedy family formally endorses President Biden over one of their own as the Biden campaign tries to seize an advantage on the trail with the presumptive Republican nominee stuck in a criminal courtroom. And House Speaker Johnson defies his right-wing critics and vows to plow forward with a foreign funding package that includes aid for Ukraine, even if getting a deal across the finish line costs him his job. Hello and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Ryan Nobles in Washington. But we begin today in New York, where efforts to seat a jury at Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial appear to be moving backwards. And the former president's conduct during the trial is again coming under scrutiny. Today, two jurors who had been seated were dismissed, with one telling the judge that she was concerned that her identity might have been revealed. That same juror was the subject of a series of attacks by conservative media last night. The other juror, who was excused after prosecutors voiced concerns about his credibility. Right now, five jurors have been seated, 12 jurors and six alternates need to be selected before we can proceed to opening arguments. The seated jurors include three men and two women. Two are attorneys, one is a teacher, one an engineer, and one works in sales. Today's developments show just how tenuous and tedious every stage of this trial will be. Here's what one excused prospective juror told my colleague Vaughn Hilliard about the process. And then he said, you know, if, if there's a reason that uh, you don't think you could be impartial uh, or, or that you could be perceived as biased, uh, that you should raise your hand. So I raised my hand because I was certain that uh, even if and intellectually I would be capable of being unbiased, that because I have satirized Mr. Trump often in my artwork, um, that this would come to light. And as jury selection continues, prosecutors appear to have grown increasingly concerned about the former president's conduct during this opening phase of the trial accusing him this morning of violating a gag order that forbids him from making certain statements about potential witnesses or jurors seven times this week alone. Judge Juan Marchand plans to address potential violations of the gag order next Tuesday. The former president's lawyers argue he is just responding to political attacks and he has not violated that gag order. NBC News national correspondent Yasmin Vesugian joins me now. She is outside the Manhattan courthouse. Also with me, Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney and a current NBC News legal analyst. So, Yasmin, let's start with you. So where do things stand right now on yeah. jury selection? Are we making any progress? Making some progress in that folks are being struck. Uh, more, more jurors are being dropped. You talked about how we started out the day at 7, and Judge Juan Marchand started this next phase of this jury selection by stating that, then dropped down to 5 after jury number 4 and jury number 2 um, were ex excluded. Um, one of them, as you mentioned, because fear of their identity um, uh, being known to folks outside of that courtroom. Now they are kind of going through the process in which both attorneys from both sides are talking through who they think should actually be struck. And some of them are having to bring into the courtroom in front of Judge Juan Marchand to ask them further questions about um, where they stand on certain things. There was one individual who talked about having read Mark Pomerantz's book. Now, Mark Pomerantz was um, part of Manhattan DA Cy Vance's office investigating former President Donald Trump and then also part of Alvin Bragg's office, but then resigned a month um, into Alvin Bragg's term. This juror talked about how she had read Mark Pomerantz's entire book and talked a lot about it with her friends. However, she could still be fair and impartial. That juror was subsequently struck. They are having a Q&A with another juror as well who mentioned that she actually knew Susan Necklace and her husband was a former U.S. attorney who also knew Susan Necklace and knew the understanding or understood, I should say, the legal issues that the former president was facing. She is currently being questioned um, by both sides, by both prosecution and defense, as to whether or not she should remain as part of this jury. 
for this portion, right, when it is a strike by cause, it really ends up being on the shoulders of Judge Juan Mershon to make that final Ryan decision to either keep them or let them go. Just to remind you, each side has four peremptory strikes left, meaning they say, I don't want Yasmin to be a, a juror on this jury, and they strike them. Uh, but beyond that, Judge Juan Mershon is the final say when it comes to striking by cause. And it's been interesting uh, hearing from these dismissed jurors about the process uh, as they leave for the day. Uh, you spoke to one of those jurors. What, what did they tell you? Um, I, sorry, I was just looking down on my phone, Ryan, because I'm getting a note from my producer um, seeing kind of the back and forth between the potential jurors and the attorneys. So I spoke to one of the jurors um, that was struck from um, this jury pool. Um, she was one of the folks that raised her hand when they asked, can you be um, impartial if you were to if you were to sit on this jury? And it was earlier on in the day and she raised her hand because she said to me that she could, in fact could not be impartial. The amazing thing, Ryan, is that she was she became a U.S. citizen last August um, and November will be the first presidential election that she will actually vote in. And when she was called for jury duty, this is the trial in which she was called for. Here's some of what she had to say to me. Everybody was shocked. Everybody was frozen. Uh, no, like frozen, no expressions, nothing. We were all, you know. Did he, did, that he was look, the case. did he look back at you? Did any of the attorneys look back at you at that time? Uh, sometimes Trump would turn his head, Yeah. Uh, but that was it. He doesn't look angry or I think he looks bored, like he wants this to finish. She said everybody kind of understood, Ryan, the gravity of the situation, walking in and being completely shocked the former president was sitting there, that this was the trial that they were really walking into. One more note. That, that individual that I was just talking about, whose attorney, whose husband was an attorney, um, in fact, Judge Juan Marchand denied her being a struck, so she remains um, still a potential juror. Okay, Yasmin, thank you for that report. We appreciate it. Uh, Barbara, let's go to you now. Uh, you have uh, reporters crawling all over this courthouse. Uh, it is the, probably the most anticipated trial, uh, certainly in recent American history. How is it possible uh, to get a collection of jurors who pri whose privacy and anonymity can be guaranteed? Is this going to be a constant concern throughout the trial, even after the jury is seated? I think it, it may be, and I think that what the parties and the judge are going to need to do is to reassess, because, uh, you know, this, this juror was um, removed and excused today after she revealed that you know, she didn't think she could be fair because it seemed likely that her identity would be revealed. You know, people are saying, hey, I know what you look like. I know that you live on the Upper East Side or wherever she lives. I know what you do for a living. I know what your last job was. Is this you? Um, and if that kind of information comes out about all of these jurors, then I, I think it's not going to be hard to, for people to figure out who they are. And that's that really violates the goal here of an anonymous jury and kind of the assurances that these jurors have been given. So very good that she got excused today. What could be really problematic is if we get two or three weeks in, and jurors start, start dropping. I think the plan is to have two alternates. But if you start losing jurors, you could have a mistrial situation, have to start over. So I think that if I were party to this case, I would be getting my opposing counsel and the judge together and seeing if there aren't ways that we could improve the anonymity of the jurors here. One way is rather than asking them where they work, simply asking them what they do for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be a little less revealing to the public. Um, maybe not disclosing so specifically the communities where they live. Um, and also, I know Judge Mershon is asking the, pub, the, the the press now not to report on the physical description of the jurors. You know, does it really matter whether they're tall or short or the color of their hair? And so perhaps that could be another way uh, to protect their anonymity. But I think this is something that the parties need to get right now up front before we get into the, the heart of the substance of this trial. And does the judge have a lot of discretion about what information can and cannot be released to the public? Could theoretically they remove reporters from the room when biographical information is being released and, and have that not be made public? How, how much flexibility does he have? Yeah, no, I, I think that if the judge gets uh, too restrictive here, we are going to see the press file a lawsuit for media access to the courtroom because typically the press is allowed to report on anything that a member of the public could observe by sitting in that courtroom. And so, you know, a physical description, the judge may say, is not 
relevant to their ability to perform their duties as jurors. But if somebody were sitting in that courtroom, that is something that they could observe. And so uh, it may be that we see a battle between the press and the judge if the judge gets too restrictive. So he certainly does have some discretion, but there is also this First Amendment right mm -hmm. to free press access that I think could be infringed if he starts getting too restrictive here. So, um, you know, he. It's not an absolute right. There is uh, an ability to limit things if there's a compelling reason and it's narrowly tailored to achieve that reason. And so protecting their identity from threats and the integrity of this case could be a reason for that sort of restriction. Okay, I don't think we expected this to be a simple process, right? So it's probably not a surprise <laughs> that there's been some hiccups here, but we've got two jurors that have been dismissed. Uh, but on the other side of this, we do have five that have been seated, at least for now. Uh, do you think that we're about where we need to be in terms of this process right now, or are we behind schedule? No, I think overall, actually, we're doing fine. Um, you know, after the first couple of days, the fact that we had seven struck me as really fast in light of what a high profile case this is. Uh, you know, a former president on trial, you're not gonna find anybody who's never heard of him or doesn't have some opinion of him. Of course, the question is whether despite your, your knowledge coming in, you can set that aside and decide this case based on the facts and the law that you receive here in court. Um, and so, you know, as we're seeing in response to these questions, when the judge asks the whole pool, is there anybody who can't be fair? Lots of hands go up. Um, and so this is quite unusual in light of most cases. Uh, you know, I've been involved in jury selection most often in a routine case that takes about a day, maybe less, maybe half a day, depending on the facts of the case. Um, this one I thought might take a week or more. Mm -hmm. The fact that we've got five jurors on Thursday, there's another day tomorrow. I think by the time this day is done, we'll probably have more. And of course, Ryan, they're down four peremptory challenges now. So I, yeah. I think it's likely to go more quickly. I think we can still have a jury selected by the end of the day tomorrow. Okay, Barbara McQuaid, always the optimist. We appreciate that. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, and it is what is going to become a theme of this presidential campaign on display once again today. While Donald Trump stands trial, President Biden is on the trail, campaigning for a third consecutive day in Pennsylvania. Today, the president was in Philadelphia, where he received a public endorsement for, from members multiple members of the Kennedy family. We can say today with no less urgency that our rights and freedoms are once again in peril. This is why we all need to come together in a campaign that should unite not, unite not only Democrats, but all Americans, including Republicans and independents who believe in what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. A vote for Joe Biden is a vote for our democracy and our decency. That endorsement, of course, meant to send a clear signal from the Kennedys that they oppose the candidacy of one of their own, RFK Jr., who is, of course, running as an independent. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memley joins me now uh, with more. So, Mike, uh, tell me, how did this endorsement from the Kennedy family come together? Well, what's so interesting about this, Ryan, is that we are told, according to sources close to the family, that this has been months in the making. And according to uh, the Biden campaign, they've really been following the, the Kennedy's lead here. Uh, it was clear from a very early stage uh, how concerned even RFK Jr.'s own siblings were about the possibility that he would play a spoiler in this race. And they look at it as a threat to the family legacy here. If RFK Jr. gets sufficient votes in a sufficient number of states to tip the balance to Donald Trump, they feared that this really would you know, be a, 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 a dark mark against the family legacy. And so there had been conversations with the White House about the best way to move this forward. We saw the seeds of this with that dramatic photo from uh, St. Patrick's Day with dozens of Kennedys gathered in the Rose Garden with the President of the United States. And ultimately, this was a capper to this three-day blitz through Pennsylvania. The family values stop, you could put it, uh, in Scranton. The, the union stop in Pittsburgh. And then today, a, a reminder of what's at stake in this election from the Kennedys in Philadelphia. And how has RFK Jr. responded to all of this? Well, our, what RFK Jr. has said, and including to, to saying to our own colleague Vaughn Hilliard, is that, listen, like any family, we have fierce political debates at the kitchen table with each other, and that there are other members of the family that do support him. But we've been challenging the Kennedy campaign to lay out just who those family members are, because that's why, and that's what's driven the urgency on the part of those members of the family that you saw on stage with President Biden today. They don't want their brother, their cousin, their uncle to get away with per, the perception that there are others, just as many perhaps, who are supporting th th their own, that th no, that the family is squarely behind President Biden. Okay, uh, Mike Memley, thank you for that reporting. Coming up, we will head to Pennsylvania 
for the view from voters on what's motivating them to turn out or if they'll turn out at all. But first, capital consequences. We are live on the Hill, where House Speaker Mike Johnson insists that he's moving forward on trying to pass foreign aid for Ukraine, regardless of whether he could lose his job over it. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. With his job in jeopardy, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson is defiantly pushing forward on a foreign aid package that includes emergency wartime aid for Ukraine, meaning he is about to confront head-on the very issue that has pushed the right wing of his conference to call for his ouster. And he is doing it with a notable change of heart. For months, Johnson has joined those hardliners in rebuffing the White House's calls for urgency around the issue of aid to Ukraine. But now the speaker is calling Ukraine aid, quote, critically important, so important, in fact, that he's willing to lose his job over it. If I operated uh, out of fear over a motion to vacate, I would never be able to do my job. I, look, history judges us for what we do. This is a critical time right now, a critical time on the world stage. I, I could make a, you know, I, I could make a selfish decision and, and, and do something that, um, th th that's different, but I, I'm doing here what I believe to be the right thing. But that pledge is set to be put to the test, with the pressure facing the speaker showing no signs of letting up. The House Freedom Caucus says that it's urging its members to kill the procedural vote on the foreign aid funding after a group of Republican hardliners cornered the speaker on the floor today to pressure him not to put Ukraine aid on the floor. Joining me now from Capitol Hill is NBC's Julie Serkin. So, uh, Julie, what's the latest uh, of this foreign funding that's driving the frustration on the right? And, and where does this latest bill stand right now? Yeah, Ryan. Well, the Rules Committee, as you know, in the House has actually recessed. They have yet to come back together. This is the panel that is made up of Republicans and Democrats, but of course requires usually a majority party to pass the rule before it can even get to the floor, meaning the Republicans, including the hardliners in the committee, would in theory have to support this rule in order for it to move forward. There's some chatter that some Democrats might actually have to come out and save Republicans in order to move the Speaker's own rule on his own set of bills to provide that aid and to unlock it overseas, including for Ukraine, for Israel, for the Indo-Pacific as well. So until that happens, we really don't know the fate of these bills. But Speaker Johnson had wanted a, a vote on these bills, the full House, to take it up on Saturday night. That's because he's giving members those 72 hours to read the bills. The bills look very largely similar to the Senate passed package that they moved over to the House back in February that has been stalled there. That's $95 billion in in, at $95 billion in aid to Ukraine and Israel again. But uh, overall here, a lot of frustration behind the scenes. Hardliners trying to uh, threaten Speaker Johnson. We'll see if that holds, of course, as Democrats and moderate Republicans increasingly want to move to save him. And let's talk about the timeline a little bit uh, and, and talk more about the dust up on the floor today. What kind of pressure is Johnson facing from his right? Well, I was outside of the House chamber watching this huddle on the House floor in the back corner, Ryan. It was away from camera, so nobody could really see it. But we had our own look at it. Johnson in the middle of a group of hardliners, members of the House Freedom Caucus, that really have operated as a thorn in the side of the Speaker before it was Kevin McCarthy, of course. Then after he was ousted, it became Speaker Mike Johnson. Uh, but then you had one Republican congressman, Derek Van Orden, who told me on the phone a couple of hours ago that he actually went into that huddle to protect Mike Johnson. He facetiously, sort of humorously uh, tempted those group of rabble rousers to go ahead and bring up that motion to kick Johnson out. What they wanted, uh, Ryan, is for Johnson to not put Ukraine aid on the floor until the Senate took up the conservative border bill known as H.R. 2 that Democrats who control both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue in the Senate and the White House has said for months they will not put on the floor. Johnson said no to that in part because of that but you played at the top there. He is in support of Ukraine aid. He said very strongly for the first time perhaps ever that Putin would continue his escalation in Europe if the U.S. did not send these lethal weapons. So the bottom line here is the House will vote Saturday night if they get this passed through the Rules Committee. The Senate hopes to take it up shortly after, Ryan. Okay, thank you for that, Julie. Let's uh, talk more about this with somebody who has a vote in this process, and that's the Republican congressman from Nebraska, Congressman Don Bacon. Congressman, appreciate you being here, and let's get right into it. Uh, first of all, where are you uh, on this foreign aid package? Can you support all of the different planks? And are you even confident that they can get out of the Rules Committee and to 
a place where you'd have the opportunity to vote on it? Well, the first question is easier for me to answer than the second. I do plan on supporting them, but they're not optimal. Uh, you know, the speaker has had a good heart on this. We want to secure the border. We're trying to pressure the president uh, to do more. He's got the he's got the authorities already that he could use. Uh, but I don't think failing in border security makes it right to also fail Ukraine or fail Israel. And that's sort of the argument right now. If we don't get border security, we can't help out Ukraine or Israel. And both of them are in our national security interest. So I intend on supporting uh, the, the different, the separate legislation, one for Israel, one for Ukraine, one for Taiwan. Uh, I wish, I think some of them have a little bit too much humanitarian aid in them, but you can't let perfection be the enemy of good here. Uh, in the end, Ukraine, it's in our national security interest that remain independent. And Israel is our best ally in the Middle East, and they expended lots of munitions trying to protect themselves from 330 uh, you know, projectiles that Iran fired at them last Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do intend to support that. Now, your question on the rules. It appears to me that it's gonna have to take some collaboration between the uh, Democrat leadership and Republican leadership to get this out of rules. I do know that on the floor, some Democrats already told me they plan on voting yes because they agree with the legislation. So I do see a pathway that this is going to get through. Uh, it's a, it's unfortunate that we have 20, 30 people that do not want to cooperate with the speaker, and that effectively makes us a minority, mm -hmm. and it actually weakens our hand. Uh, but it's going to take some cooperation working with the other side to get this done. All right, let's talk about uh, the Ukraine bill with a little bit more specificity. Two weeks ago, you told Kristen Welker on Meet the Press that you didn't want to give the president a blank check. But now some of you and your colleagues are even saying that Biden has not given enough to Ukraine. So which is it? Where's the problem here? Well, so I would prefer more military, just keeping it to military aid and reducing the humanitarian. You know, the EU has done a lot of the uh, humanitarian. They just passed $50 billion or 50 billion, 50 billion euros uh, out of the EU to help out with humanitarian. Now, we did get some wins, and this is wins that I fought for. I want to ensure that the president includes ATACM weapons to Ukraine. These, these munitions have a 180 mile range. They can hit a mailbox. Sending Ukraine these ATACM weapons will be a game changer because the Russians hide behind the lines far enough back where they can't be targeted, and this ATACM will change that. Mm -hmm. And so we have this in the bill. And that's what I mean by not giving the president a blank check. Uh, we, we've done billions of dollars and, they, and they've been sending, for the most part, uh, 155 millimeter shells, shoulder fired uh, anti-tank weapons. Later, after a lot of prodding, they did the harpoon missiles, which were good, but it should have been done earlier. Uh, we've done Patriots. It could have been done a lot earlier. We, we're still wanting to send F-16s. They're not there yet. So I'm trying to push the president to send more capable weapons that can change the fight on the field. Okay, let's talk now about uh, the situation uh, that this has left Speaker Johnson in. Uh, you've said in the past that you thought he could lose his speakership over Ukraine. Marjorie Taylor Greene has said that she's not going to bring a motion to vacate until after the vote on the foreign aid bill. Do you think that is still likely? And do you think she's got enough willing partners that Johnson could lose his job? I suspect one or two are going to do this uh, after getting to know how they operate in the last couple of years. I disagree with it totally. It weakens Congress, it weakens our party. Uh, it, it's a, a, a boon to the Democrats in November's elections. Uh, so I think it's a, a shameful or a, just plain wrong. Uh, that said, I think the speaker will survive this because I know a lot of Democrats who think, hey, the, the speaker is trying to do what's right for our country and he should not lose his job over that. So I suspect, unlike a table motion, but if a vacate motion is put in, uh, we'll move to table that motion and if we win that, it's done. It will be it will be over. Uh, with Pres or with Speaker McCarthy, we tried it and we didn't have the votes for tabling. I think this time, if some of the Democrats vote to table or don't even vote at all, mm -hmm. uh, that the Speaker will survive it. But it's a shame that we have to do this. We're not operating as a team. All the norms that I'm used to when I got elected in 2017 uh, have been dissipated. You know, we've never vacated a Speaker before. Uh, we. It took, I think it was 18 years what, before a rule has been 
voted down on the floor. We've done that seven or eight times now. And now we have people campaigning in each other's districts. It's a real shame. Uh, we should expect more of ourselves. And 95% of us are doing it right. It's a yeah. small group that's really ruining the whole team. You know, I, I was uh, in uh, one of the press availabilities with the speaker yesterday, uh, and it struck me how much he's changed his tune as it relates to funding for Ukraine. You, I mean, I'm sure you know that he voted against Ukraine funding uh, before he became speaker. I know you've been a strong supporter of Ukraine funding from the very beginning. What do you think has been the biggest change in the speaker's view of this? Why has he now been gone from someone willing to vote against it to someone now championing the idea and potentially putting himself up at the risk of losing his job? Well, I could talk a whole show on this. I don't know if I could fit it all in in a minute or two here. Uh, first of all, he was representing Northwest Louisiana. I think it's more conservative. Now he's the Speaker of the House. He's, he's the Speaker for the United States of America. Two, he's always told me he supported Ukraine and that uh, an independent Ukraine is our national security interest. He has shared my views personally. And when he ran for Speaker, made it pretty clear where his heart lies. But I also think now instead of being, you know, a, 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 just a... A conservative, one conservative of, two, of 222, being the Speaker of the House now, it's different. He, he has to govern. And governing, as defined by James Madison, who wrote the Constitution, it forces us to find consensus and to work together. You can't be a flamethrower or a nihilist or burn the house down kind of mindset and govern. And he is trying to govern. And the the Constitution is written to protect the minority. Mm -hmm. You've got to work with the other side or a divided government. And I think he has seen this and learned it, and he is and he's applying it right now. So we're seeing him step up and govern for our country. Okay, uh, I have you stay all uh, the rest of the hour and talk about that. But I know you have another meeting, so I I'm going to let you go, Congressman Bacon. Thank you so much for your thank perspective. You. We appreciate it. And we do have uh, some breaking news to report out of New York. That's where two more jurors have been seated in Donald Trump's hush money trial. One is a male investment banker. The other, a male security engineer. That means we're back up to seven jurors that have now been selected. Five of them are men, two are women. We still, though, need five additional jurors and six alternates chosen before they can move on with the trial. And up next, crisis and conflict in the Middle East. We'll have NBC's exclusive interview with a top leader of Hezbollah, the Iran-backed militant group behind the latest missile attack on northern Israel that injured more than a dozen Israeli troops. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. Today, White House and Pentagon officials met virtually with Israeli officials to discuss their plans for the IDF's potential ground offensive into Rafah. It's a follow-up on the contentious meetings earlier this month where a top advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu began yelling as he defended Israel's plans for Rafah, that according to U.S. officials familiar with the meeting. Now, according to a readout of today's meeting, the U.S. side, which included National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, once again expressed their concerns about some of Israel's actions in Rafah. As Israel continues to finalize its plans for Rafah in Gaza, the region and the world continues to brace for the potential of an Israeli response to Iran after that massive aerial attack over the weekend. The Biden administration is urging Israel to show restraint amid concerns about rising tensions in the region. Meanwhile, the White House also took steps of its own following last weekend's attack, announcing new sanctions on Iranian drone manufacturers, as well as sanctions on Iran's steel industry. Joining me now is retired four-star General Joseph Votel, who is a former commander of the U.S. Central Command. He's now a distinguished senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. Uh, let's uh, get into this, uh, General, and talk uh, about the interview my colleague Matt Bradley had with the second-in-command of Hezbollah. Of course, Hezbollah is the uh, Iranian proxy group in Lebanon. Uh, they've been exchanging cross-border fire with Israel. But I want to get your reaction to some of what he had to say about Israel's potential response to last week's drone attack. What are you expecting Israel's attack to be? The Israeli people do not know if they will or not. Do you want me to know what the Israel Do you think Israel doesn't have a plan right now? لا تملك خطة ولا تملك جرأة ولا تعرف ماذا تفعل وإذا أخطأت الثمن كبير Do you think they're scared? خائفون مئة بالمئة لم يتوقعوا أن ترد إيران وردت 
uh, General, he almost seems to be baiting them to a certain extent. Uh, what yeah. do you think the reality of the situation is in Israel? Do you think that they have a plan to respond? Will they respond at all? No, thanks, Ryan. It's good to be with you. Yeah, I absolutely think the uh, the Israelis have a plan here. And the fact that they've taken four or five days since the attacks of last weekend to think through this, I think demonstrates they're taking on board the advice that has been given to them by the United States and probably a number of the other partners in terms of making very deliberate decisions about how how they respond to this uh, this unprecedented attack that was launched against them uh, them last week. And so, yeah, I, my own experience working with the Israelis is they don't go into things uh, hastily and they think through the second and third order effects of things. And, and I think that's certainly what is occurring in this case. You mentioned the fact that they have been talking to some of their allies who have uh, uh, pretty much across the board have asked them to show restraint. Uh, I mean, what would you view uh, as a response that would escalate the situation, make it worse, versus something that would be restrained and perhaps contain the situation to how it currently exists? Yeah, you know, Israel, I think, has a lot of options in this. So I think something that would be definitely escalatory would be if they perhaps tried to go after what I would consider to be kind of strategic targets, things related to uh, related to the nuclear weapons program or uh, related to more centralized command and control uh, activities in, you know, deep into into Iran. Those I think would 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 almost definitely merit some type of response from um, from uh, from Iran. On the other hand, going after perhaps targets in the western part of Iran that are really focused on maybe the launch sites for missiles or 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 drone sites might might uh, might elicit uh, a much much less of a response from uh, from the Iranians, uh, particularly if they didn't. Uh, if they were able to be uh, d uh, done in a way that weren't weren't well known to the to the broader Iranian public, and they could protect the you know the Iranians had the ability to protect their own messaging. But you still think that Israel has on the table the possibility of striking Iran directly? That still remains something that they could do. I, I think I think that it is uh, now. Ultimately, uh, Israel will have to make the make the decision on that. Certainly that's not the only things they can do. There are Iranian assets that are located that that are vulnerable, that are of great value to Iran that uh, that certainly could be targeted outside of Iran. And of course, uh, uh, they could always return to, you know, the tactics that have been used in the so-called shadow war here for a number of years uh, between both sides. Um, so uh, I think I think Israel has a lot of options here. I think they're weighing through that. Certainly, you know, it's striking back on Iranian territory, I think, does carry a level of risk that I think has to be considered very, very deliberately. And they also have the geopolitical concerns uh, to deal with as well, right? I mean, they have all uh, these allies who are putting a lot of pressure to try and de-escalate the situation. You also have what's becoming a more strained relationship between the prime minister and President Biden, the uh, White House, other, the United Nations, others kind of pressuring for ceasefire talks uh, to continue with Qatar and Egypt. And then you've got the own uh, Netanyahu's political turmoil at home as well. How, do all of these factors play into the decision-making process here? They, they absolutely do, Ryan. And, and you've, you've encapsulated a number of them quite well. I mean, they have to consider the mood and the attitude of their own citizens and how they're looking at this. They have to uh, they have to consider the alliances and partnerships. Uh, uh, you know, the things have changed a little bit in the last four or five days. There are now 47, 48 countries that have come out and condemned the attacks by Iran. That's a that that's a different that's a different uh, information environment than we had just a just a week ago. They've got to consider what's going on in Gaza. Remember, all of this this activity over the last week has had no impact on on the situation in Gaza, and and Israel still has a very very serious situation there that they need to resolve. And of course, they have to think through the long term impacts of this beyond just how Iran will respond to this. They've got to think about how they control an escalation cycle. They've got to think about how they look for possible off-ramps to get this back into something that is more manageable long-term mm -hmm. in, the, in the region. So yeah, there's a ton of factors that they've got to consider in this. A complicated situation, uh, an understated way uh, to it, describe it. Uh, General Joseph Votel, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you, Ron.
Good After the break, the youngest voters and the oldest candidate. New polls out of Harvard show that America's youth are backing Biden in 2024, but the margins could show signs of trouble for the president's re-election campaign. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back, and we have some more breaking news out of New York. That's where we now have a full jury in Donald Trump's hush money trial. Twelve jurors have now been seated. Judge Mershon announced moments ago, quote, we have our jury. The process not quite over yet. They still need to select six alternates, but that is breaking news that 12 people have been officially uh, selected for the jury in the Donald Trump hush money trial. So let's talk about this. Joining me on set is Eugene Scott, senior political reporter, politics reporter, I should say, at Axios, former New York Congressman Joe Crowley, a Democrat, of course, and Sarah Chamberlain, the president and CEO of the Republican Main Street Partnership. So Eugene, let's start with you. Sure. I think maybe a bit of a surprise that yes. they were able uh, to whittle down this field and get 12 jurors this quickly. Absolutely. I think we thought it could take weeks mm -hmm. and, and there were moments where it seemed like they were making progress and having to take a few steps back but I think this is really uh, fascinating and a really important time obviously in American history I think one of the things that's going to be really uh, good for many people to learn is just how different Manhattan is and the different walks of life various people come from and the abilities that they have to play the role that they need to in this very important moment yeah you're our resident New Yorker Congressman. Yeah. <laughs> what, what should we expect of this jury well, I think it's, you know, first of all, it's, it, it, it probably will, will be the trial of the century, you know. <laughs> so uh, I think some of these folks are a bit nervous and scared about it. I think we saw that in terms of at least one of the jurors who was initially um, uh, installed and, and, and asked to be replaced. I think some fear there, um, you know, but uh, I think it's, it speaks volumes for the system that 12 individuals, peers, are willing to take the time uh, to deliberate mm -hmm. and I think honestly do that. That's the hope. Yeah. Uh, evaluate the evidence and render a decision. But Sarah, there's obviously a, a, so much politics that is kind of over all the top of this. And we've already seen the former president's political allies attack these jurors who are mm -hmm. anonymous to all of us, suggesting already that they're just liberal pawns. I mean, do you think this is something that's going to continue throughout the course of the trial? Absolutely, without question. And that's why they have a lot of courage to do this. Mm -hmm. I wish them well as they go through this process. Um, but it's a process we need to do. And I hope, I'm glad it's going quickly because I hope to get this behind us soon, okay. especially before the convention. All right, I want to talk now about a, a new poll from our friends at the Harvard Institute of Politics. It says that President Biden has an eight-point lead over former President Trump among voters aged 18 to 29. It's a little better than he's fared in some of the polls out there, but it's not really a major edge. President Biden's lead increases, though, to 19 points among likely voters. That's still short of the 24-point margin he had with voters in 2020. And check this out. Now, if you include third-party candidates and look at the sample of all young voters in this poll, things get interesting real fast. President Biden at 28 percent, Trump at 25 percent, RFK Jr. at 11 percent, Jill Stein and Cornell West both in low single digits, but that could be important in swing states. Uh, Eugene, I think at first blush, you look at this and say, President Biden still owns youth voters, but he needs to own them by a wide margin mm -hmm. in order to be successful, right? He does. So I think a few things are worth noting. The Harvard Institute of Politics is based at the Harvard Kennedy School. And when I talk <laughs> to swing voters and independent voters and young voters, the Kennedy name still matters, mm -hmm. even to people who don't know a whole lot about RFK, mm -hmm. in part because people are really disappointed with both Trump and Biden, especially young voters. And one of the things that's important to remember when you're talking about 18-year-olds or even 24-year-olds, think about how young they were in 2016. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that they do not remember about the Trump presidency that's making them consider him in ways that people who are more familiar with him probably would not. Is that an issue for the president, uh, Joe, that you have uh, an 18 year old that didn't really remember what Donald Trump was like back in 2016? Yeah, we, we kind of think about 9 11. We all lived through it. Mm -hmm. These folks didn't. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. it's not even a memory for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I think the, the short term memory that they have right now, and uh, we were all. Uh, 
uh, 18 or 24 <laughs> at one point. <laughs> that we understand, you know, it, especially the lack of confidence in the future, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, that is expressed in the poll as well. But when have when have teenage, you know, late teens, early 20s ever been confident about the future? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and I think it's something you adapt to. But I do, I do think that the the White House has to be concerned about that. But I also believe that as time goes on, especially if there is a conviction, we know those numbers change. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I think that people will come back to Biden. The biggest, the, the, the more important issue here, I think, is the third party. Mm -hmm. And that's where I have more concerns. Especially, it was good to see the Kennedy family do that today. It was the second time they've done it. Um, but I, 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 I have concerns about Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sarah, do you think that young voters understand that a vote for a third party likely means that the person they vote for is not going to win, but their vote could still have an impact on the election itself. They don't really understand all of that. I've got a daughter sitting in this age who she doesn't really remember much about Trump. But to her, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but Joe Biden is an old man. He's like, he's older than Grandpa. I'm like, oh, gosh. But the reality is, like, they kind of like the Kennedy thing. Yeah. And they're concerned about the inflation. They're yeah. concerned about, you know, the, the older um, men and women buying homes for the first time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a nephew who's buying a home. It's it's almost 8% interest. Yeah. I mean, so that's what's driving this. And, and Kennedy is pulling that. Economics, I believe, was the main issue on that poll yeah. that was making mm -hmm. so many of these young voters entertained. Trump. You have to remember, he's still a businessman. That's what they know about him. And so that sounds more attractive to them. I will say one thing that Biden probably really has to do, and maybe Trump as well, they got to step up their surrogate game and get people yes. who can connect with these young voters yep. who are their age, you know, some celebrities, some True. athletes. That's going to help both parties. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about what's happening on Capitol Hill right now. And I do want to play a mash of how Speaker Johnson has evolved on the issue of Ukraine funding uh, from after he met with Zelensky in December to today. Take a listen. We need a clear articulation of the strategy to allow Ukraine to win. And thus far, their responses have been insufficient. They have not provided us the clarity and the detail that we have requested over and over since literally 24 hours after I was handed the gavel as Speaker of the House. I have also made very clear from day one that our first condition on any national security supplemental spending package is about our own national security first. I think pr providing lethal aid to Ukraine right now is critically important. I really do. I really do believe the intel and, and the briefings that we've gotten that, G that, um, that I, I believe Xi and, and, and Vladimir Putin and and Iran really are an axis of evil. I think they're in coordination on this. I think that Vladimir Putin would continue to march through Europe if he were allowed. This is not a game. It's not a joke. We can't play politics of this. We have to do the right thing. And I'm willing to take personal risk for that because we have to do the right thing, and history will judge us. Joe, I was in both of those gaggles, the one in December, the one yesterday. I was struck by mm -hmm. the speaker's tone. Mm -hmm. You're a man that sat in, in leadership meetings yep. as a member of Congress. I'm sure you had classified briefings. Mm -hmm. Is it different for him, given the intel that he's been given about this situation? I think it really demonstrates the weight of this office. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I have to say, I'm impressed that mm -hmm. he's grown. Um, a lot has changed. A lot has happened since December. Mm -hmm. And he's willing to accept that. Uh, that we're at a critical junction. Uh, we see the morale of the troops in Ukraine is waning. Uh, the Russians are dug in. Uh, and the you know, only way we're going to have an effective win here is if the U.S. and our allies engage and support the efforts in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I, I really say, I think this I, I think speaks, I think, volumes maybe to his character, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that he's willing to put on the line his speakership, mm -hmm. his leadership, to do the right thing. And I think... All Americans appreciate that. To that yeah. point, Sarah, some of the things that the speaker said yesterday, we have to put our partisan differences aside. We have to govern. We have to work with the minority. These are all things he didn't say when he was a rank-and-file right. member of Congress. And it's not something we're hearing from rank-and-file Republicans. Do you think his job is in danger? I do not. The Republican Main Street Partnership members support him 100%. They will be there. They will have his back. And he has grown significantly in this job. And the other thing, too, is he spends a lot of time listening to Chairman Turner, Intel, mm -hmm. and Chairman Michael McCall. Mm -hmm. They're very concerned about what's going on, and they're spending hours with him. And it's nice to see him grow and be a speaker for all of the members. Eugene, I wonder, too, how much of it is, uh, who's going to be there for me when I need the help? Do you mm. think that after all this negotiating or basically being told by members of the hard right that they, he has to do it a certain way, he came to realize that maybe they wouldn't be there for him if he did everything they asked him to? 
I, I think that's very possible. And one of the things many of us were repeatedly told about Speaker Johnson, who were not familiar with him, was that he was a man of conviction mm -hmm. and a man of principle. And I think at the end of the day, he's trying to figure out what is best for the country and what's truest to him, especially if he may end up losing this position at, at some point. He's going to have to live with the decision that he's made. And I think he's making decisions that reflect that. And he has prioritized national security. Right. And whereas, quite frankly, that does not seem to be a priority for some of his critics. Yeah, and one of the arguments he made was that he was doing it not just for the country, but for the Republican Party mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. trying to convince his colleagues. They need leadership. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they do. Joe, Sarah, Eugene, great conversation. Thanks. Appreciate you all being here. Sure. Still to come, firing up voters on all sides. How one county in Battleground, Pennsylvania is getting creative to combat voter apathy in this year's election. That story's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. With so many voters saying they're not excited to vote this year, one county in Pennsylvania is trying a new way to highlight the importance of voting and encourage people of all ages to get to the polls. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns has more. This is a really uh, uh, inspiring uh, day. Beyond these glass doors, democracy is in action. We have 16 inductees into the Voter Hall of Fame. Appreciate it. This is Montgomery County, Pennsylvania's Voter Hall of Fame ceremony. 68. So first, your first election, 1968. Anybody better? Go ahead. Every year, every election, for 70 years, every crime and race. Honoring voters who've cast a ballot in the last 50 general elections. 56, 1956. Anybody got 1956 beat? This is like an auction. <laughs> Longevity has its rewards, and this <laughs> is right. one of them, to be able to live long enough and be able to say, gosh, I really have voted that many times. And you've seen some stuff in, with elections. Oh, I've seen, I've seen a lot. County Commissioner Neil McKeeja took office last year, running with an eye on restoring confidence in elections. When this seat opened up, I thought, this is a real place where we can make a difference, protect voting rights, and really set the standard in Pennsylvania and, and for the country. Right now, election enthusiasm is at an all-time low for a presidential contest, according to NBC News polling going back to 2008. Mikija hopes events like this can restore enthusiasm and trust in the process in a swing state so as much. important as Pennsylvania. There have been lies that have been spread, obviously, uh, in terms of questioning the integrity of the system. Just in your own community, how much of a problem right now is voter apathy or frustration and, or disengagement for those various reasons? Look, I think we're dealing with uh, issues of distrust uh, in politicians, in the process. Mm. We're the most courted voters <laughs> in yeah. the whole country. I think reminding people in our communities that we set the direction of the country, it will make a difference and they should make their voice heard. I kind of want to know what everyone's favorite election was. We can do that after this. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> no, this is bipartisan. Alan and Rosemary Hinkle are two of today's honorees. We didn't do this to get honored. Didn't do it for an award? <laughs> no, we did not. While they're still unsure how they'll vote in November, one thing's for certain, they'll definitely cast a ballot. Have you all had elections where you've been, where you haven't been so thrilled with the candidates? Yes. <laughs> sure. Why we do you all... show up anyway? Because you have to make a decision. If you don't want other people making the decision for you, then you have to participate. For Greg Holt, remembering a time when the right to vote wasn't guaranteed, the decision is simple. I grew up in an area that was predominantly minority. Many of those people had migrated from the South as my grandparents had. Uh, to get away from segregation, mm. where they could come to the North and be able to register and vote. It was important to them. Cheers. What's your message now to the folks who are looking at this election, feeling frustrated, feeling apathetic, and don't want to engage? Well, I, I think there's always going to be frustrations in life, but not voting has consequences. 
And thanks to Dasha for that reporting. I want to bring in now Lauren Make of our NBC station in Philadelphia. She's been talking to both voters and activists who are working to get out the vote. Uh, Lauren, uh, I know you talk to these reporters all the, or all these voters all the time. And Dasha's piece focused on rewarding older voters for their commitment. But how are activists there looking to boost participation from young voters who historically just aren't as likely to vote? Yeah, well, Ryan, there there are a number of ways already, and I'm sure that we will see more uh, efforts crop up as the year goes on. I can tell you here in Philadelphia, for example, uh, one of the ways is using the younger, n newer, younger generation of leaders to carry the message. There is an effort here called Black Men Vote. It was started by a handful of city council members in Philadelphia who are all in their 30s, and they saw this as an opportunity to to be able to make connections that maybe others couldn't. Uh, I've also been in touch with Black Voters Matter, which is a group that does a lot of work on the ground here in Pennsylvania. They tell me as they are reaching out to young voters this year, they are going issues first and sort of letting those young people set the agenda and tell them what they're interested in and what they want to talk about and letting that guide the conversation. But I'm sure we will see more cropping up as they try to um, uh, get people to commit to, to coming out to vote. And do you, does it seem as though these folks are receptive to these efforts? Uh, well, you know, I said there's not just one way to do it, and, and sometimes it might be in ways that um, you don't expect. I can tell you we're, we're here covering a visit by President Biden today. We're in North Philadelphia, and I was talking to a group of voters who uh, were impressed by the fact that the president was coming to North Philadelphia. Uh, this is a neighborhood. It's not Center City. He was going to a rec center here, and that made an impact on them. They felt like that was an effort to make a connection, but they are still looking for a little bit more. I want to play you some uh, part of my conversation with one of those young voters. We really don't know what he's doing. And so maybe that's why I'm glad that he came, so we could see more, we could hear more, we could talk to him more. Because honestly, in my age group, we don't know. We'll probably say he's not doing nothing. But it's just because we don't know much, you know what I mean? So he needs I'm, to tell he needs to tell people. Yeah, get more connecting with the with the get more connection with the with the group, with the younger group too. It's good to see the politicians, but if you want our vote, you gotta come speak to the voters. And she told me that she is, she voted for President Biden in 2020. She is not voting for President Trump this year. But when it comes to whether she'll vote for President Biden again, she doesn't know. She is still listening. So that's why she felt like it was important for him to come here. She's listening to what he'll have to say in the coming months. Right? Quite the message. If you want the vote, you've got to come talk to the voters. That's, uh, I think, a good message for anybody running for office around the country. Lauren Make, thank you for that report. We really appreciate it. And Kristen is back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. But the news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.